Well, welcome to the Student Space panel. I'm super excited to be here with all these wonderful faces. Um, I've met each and every one of the panelists through the Thought Cloud podcast, which has been a great way for me to meet all of the students that are interested in space and in this area. They've been really applying themselves. The one thing that stands out to me is their contagious energy. And that is why I thought, hey, let's get a space panel together. Let's have them talk about their experiences. So I spoke to Gitika, Gitika and she said, let's do it 100%. And all the participants were eager to get on and uh, talk about their experience as a student looking to explore the field of space, what it's like navigating these waters as an undergraduate, really what the opportunities are. And really, we're going to focus on a big emphasis of what their student organizations do for them, not only in the sense of peer, uh, peer development, but also career development. So we're going to kick it off. Um, we've got wonderful people. We've got Marco Pareto from AggieSat, uh, which is at Texas A&M. We've got William LeCramp from uh, SEDS at UW. We've got Keshav Khandrasekhar from UCLA Bruin Spacecraft. And uh, we have uh, Githika from representing two, Ignited Thinkers and Columbia Space, Init Space Initiative. So um, we're gonna kick it off. Each person's gonna say a little bit about their background, what got them interested in space. And then we're gonna kind of dig into what it's like being a student uh, getting into this field. So why don't you kick it off, Marco? Yeah, absolutely. So happy to be here. Nice to see everyone here. Um, so I'm from AggieSat Laboratory down at Texas A&M University. And I definitely, I growing up, I always just had a space orientation. You know, my, my grandfather taught me a lot of astronomy. And then growing up with sci-fi, was just like, okay, I decided engineering was for me in high school. And that's, I just kind of took that and put one and one together, aerospace. So that's what I'm studying right now. That's my major. I'm currently a senior. And when I was uh, when I was a sophomore in college, right, I had this interest in rovers. I had done a rover competition team at another in mean, another organization, and then I realized AggieSat was starting to host a small cube rover project. So I applied, got in, and I've been here since. It's been a fun ride. Uh, it's it's a great working environment. Love the people here, but also the things you learn here and just take out, you know, um, outside of your curriculum is fantastic. So it's a good time. That's me. Awesome. Awesome. Keshav, take it away. Hey, guys. My name is Keshav, and I'm at the uh, UCLA Bruin Spacecraft Group. Uh, I first got interested in space in high school when, my cube, when our CubeSat program first got off the ground. So I thought it was a cool way to get involved in space and learn more about it. And yeah, like Marco said, the rest is history. Uh, I'm currently in the Bruin Spacecraft Group, and I plan to continue my career in the space industry. Definitely. William. Yeah. Uh, <clears> Hi. <throat> happy to be here. Um, I have been interested in space as long as I can remember. Uh, the, the first thing I wanted to be when I was a little kid was an astronaut. Um, and then later down the line, in high school, I wanted to do astrophysics, got into college, and I realized that wasn't really for me. So I joined a CubeSat club, which was like the most amazing thing. So now I'm in aerospace engineering. Very nice. And Gethika, last but not least. Yeah, I feel like I have a very long story, but um, hello everyone. My name is Gitika, and I'm a freshman at Columbia University in the College of Engineering. And I am planning to pursue a degree in biomedical engineering with a minor in econ. Um, I'm an aspiring aerospace physician and astronaut. So the intersection between space and biology really excites me. And I hope to be able to understand what happens to humans in space and how we can really use space as a new laboratory to understand medicine. Um, so a little background, so growing up, I was always excited by space, aliens. I watched Star Wars, Star Trek, literally the whole thing. Um, but I never thought of space as a real career. And that probably is because of multiple of factors. One being that neither of my parents were in the aerospace industry. I didn't know what an aerospace career, career could really look like. And so growing up, it was I loved it, but it wasn't something I thought of as a real career. Um, but it all really changed in a middle school rocketry club. I took a tech ed class as one of my electives in seventh grade, and I absolutely loved the rocketry unit. And my middle school teacher, he recognized my curiosity and passion for space. And he's like, can I go? Why don't you join my after school rocketry club? And I was like, OK, of course. And I ended up falling in love with rocketry. I think I would spend like two to three hours just building and flying the rockets at the back of my school. And I just like knew that that was what I wanted to do. 
I got involved in a few summer camps at NASA and a few internship experiences, and I combined both my passions for space and biology together um, to really just figure out that space biology is what I love and what I want to do. Um, so being a part of freshman at Columbia, I knew I had to join all the space clubs and one of the biggest one being Columbia Space Initiative with our um, teacher sponsor being Mike Massimino, who is a NASA astronaut. So it's been a great ride and I'm excited to be on this panel today. That is awesome. That is so cool. And Yudika is also representing United Thinkers. Uh, it's a nonprofit that teaches, uh, you know, kids to get their hands hands on different activities that can help them learn about space, um, which is cool. And I, I think it's a great segue for kind of letting each person speak on what it's like in that in terms of the environment of space on your campus. It can be daunting to think, what is the career? You know, it's still new. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening under the hood that I think a lot of kids that maybe aren't exposed to the industry, aren't aware of. And so I'm curious to hear from each of you what it's like within your organizations to promote, you know, getting into industry or getting involved in a way that you can build a sustainable career out of. Keisha, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, so it's been a tough challenge, actually, rebuilding the membership of the Bruin Spacecraft Group because we lost a lot of members over COVID and online, there was hard to get engagement. So one of the things that we've been really trying to do is promote what the aerospace industry actually looks like. So for that, we have certain workshops where we bring in our alumni and industry contacts and talk about you know what the space industry looks like. For example, last year we had a talker on from North of Grumman about the James Webb Space Telescope. So that got a lot of really good engagement, which kind of showed me that you know, there's a need for that, the need for kind of promoting um, what, you know, what we do to send cool things into space. So that's definitely something that we try to do. We try to bring in guest speakers from the industry and our alumni who have graduated and gone into the industry to see like, okay, this is the path forward. And I think that's something really great and something that, you know, all schools definitely do and need to do. Definitely, definitely. Marco and William, what do you guys think about anything that your organizations do in particular to help promote in that same fashion? Yeah, so um, I'm in the lucky situation where we don't really have to do that because Seattle is an aerospace city. Uh, we, we have Boeing, we have Aerojet, we have some newer companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. Pretty much everybody in the area knows about the aerospace industry, and UW itself is a school known for aerospace engineering. So we don't really have to, to promote what is the space industry um, within our, our campus, which is nice because you know, a lot of people come knowing that it's a thing that they can do. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That, that must be uh, really nice to be at the hub right there, not going to lie. <laughs> but uh, on our side, um, so it goes two ways. We we definitely, of course, provide this extracurricular disengagement on space systems engineering. But also on the more professional side, we try to host companies to give informationals. And we continuously provide, we set up like a resume bank. That's kind of a work in progress right now. It's just getting people out there and connected them with professionals in the industry. But on a, on, a, on a different side of things, we also strive to promote space awareness, you know, in local uh, STEM nights in high schools, middle schools, elementaries, and kind of get that out there. So we're trying to really increase that side of Aggies at Laboratory, which is a little more philanthropic, you know? So that's something we try to do as well. Definitely. Get a last but not least. Yeah, so I'll give like two answers, one for Columbia Space Initiative and one for Ignited Thinkers. So first, starting off with Columbia Space Initiative, we are a very large group. I think we have around a little bit under maybe 200 members, I want to say, with a lot of students who are involved on campus from all grades, uh, sorry, all four years of undergraduate plus graduate and PhD students. So we do have a lot mixed with of course, mostly undergraduate students. And we have different subgroups that are focused on various 
um, themes of space. So when people think of space, they think engineering, aeronautical engineering, but we also have sub teams, not only for the rockets and the propul propulsion teams, we also have a space microbiology team. We have a space policy team. We have an outreach team. We try to combine two different uh, topics together, um, space and something else, and try to create a sub team out of it so that students from all different majors who may not even be interested in space could still have the opportunity to join Columbia Space Initiative and figure out maybe this is an industry I want to go into with my you know, skills, skill sets in finance or my skill sets in writing, my skill sets in marketing. So really just showing that space is a very interdisciplinary field um, is something I think Columbia takes really seriously. So I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to have these different sub teams and split this very large group we have based off their particular interests. Um, additionally, in terms of outreach, I told uh, I, I was mentioning we have a specific outreach group that goes out into local elementary schools, middle schools, and we do like different science experiments with the students and just inspire them and share our passion for space and hopefully get them excited about space as well. So we have different events like that that we do throughout the year um, and we continuously try hosting galas, um, networking events, alumni sessions. Uh, we have a LinkedIn alumni group. We have um, a mentor mentee session so we can encourage students to get involved in space and how to navigate that process. We have a newsletter every Friday talking about different fellowships, internships students can apply for uh, to get their feet in the industry. So really just all over the place, I think there's a lot of things that we're doing to get students involved in space, but also inspiring younger students to hopefully follow in our footsteps into the space industry. Um, and in terms of Ignited Thinkers, so Ignited Thinkers is a nonprofit I founded in the eighth grade to spread space education to all students. So as I was mentioning, I honestly didn't think of space as a real career that I was smart enough to get into uh, because I didn't think of myself as a rocket scientist. And in middle school, without that rocketry club that gave me the confidence to pursue space, I probably would have been on a completely different trajectory. I wouldn't have really looked back and been like, oh, space is something I can get involved in. And so I wanted to be able to provide this same middle school experience I was really fortunate to have to other students. So we have different workshops, webinars, we have um, a YouTube playlist. So we have something called the Space Champion Interviews where we interview diverse space champions in the industry. And we're actually creating very tiny playlists where schools can play these videos in their classrooms to show students the different space careers they can get involved in. Um, we're working with various organizations across the world to host different space contests with our first one being in Zimbabwe uh, next summer actually called the Space Water Challenge to inspire college students to think of space as a way to innovate and create water filtration systems for space, but also bring that technology back down to earth to improve um, getting cleaner access to water. And so through different contests and programs, we're really working to um, just give this experience that I was really fortunate to have in middle school with all students and show them the opportunities that exist in space and hopefully kind of break some glass ceilings and stereotypes that exist around the industry, whether that be you need to have an engineering degree or you need to be interested in physics or math to be involved in space, which is completely not true because I'm majoring in biomedical engineering but I had my eyes set on going into the space industry. So yeah, those are the, some of the two things that we're working on. Totally, totally, totally. That's awesome. And I think it's a great segue as well to kind of talk about the hurdles that students face, um, the stigmas around what it's like coming into the field and sort of, you know, how, how you do break those glass ceilings. I'd, I'd be curious to hear, and I'm sure the audience would as well, you know, why would a student, you know, have a struggle to get into this space and why should they not really feel afraid of those worries or, you know, apprehension, so to speak. Um, you know, I kind of want to leave that as an open discussion. Yeah, I, I know I just spoke, but this topic, I think, speaks a lot to me and something that's really important to me. Um, I recently went to a conference. It was an incredible conference called the Luxembourg Space Finance Event. It was in New York City, and I was so fortunate to be invited. But something that I did notice during this event is that I was the only student who was there. There was about maybe a, a little like 50, 60 guests that were invited. I was the only student. I was one of the only women of color there. I think there was there were like five females, I want to say even, just like girls in general. They were all male. It was very male dominant. And I've never felt like so like stood out or being, I felt like I was being, I was very unique in the room. Like it, it was like I was isolated almost. And it was, it was 
weird because I've heard of it before, but I've never actually experienced it myself. I've been to other incredible conferences from ISDC to Humans to Mars Summit, um, and there was so much diversity. Like the diversity is amazing in the space industry. But this is the first event I went to where it was so male dominated. And I think it's scary sometimes when you go into a room or a situation where you don't feel like you necessarily belong or you don't have enough knowledge to be there. A lot of times when we talk about diversity, we focus on gender, we focus on, um, you know, your background, your ethnicity, but we don't focus on age either. And a lot of students who are even really deeply passionate about space can't, or they don't feel confident enough to go speak at conferences uh, or to network with professionals because they don't think they have enough background um, or skill sets to be able to go out and talk in public about their passion. So I think when we're talking about the glass ceiling, it's so important to keep like a broad vision of, you know, we also need to consider young professionals and not just focus on the elders, the elders who are already in the industry, we need to kind of provide a pathway for younger students to get involved in space. And also just finding the groups and communities where you don't feel left out. So there, I know there's incredible fellowships, like the Brooke Owens Fellowship, that's focused on empowering young women or um, gender minorities in space. So I think just trying to highlight those types of programs so students don't feel alone and don't feel like they don't belong in the industry is critical as we try to create a more diverse future in the space industry. Totally. I want to piggyback on that, Marco. I actually wanted to take that from a different side of things, just maybe a little more STEM focused. So I think one of also the misconceptions is kind of like getting us a perfect example that you don't have to be an aerospace engineer to be doing space, right? So that's something we found to be very true at Aggies at Laboratory. In fact, um, we have a lot, a large amount of um, aerospace engineers, but we also always seek mechanical, especially electrical with a lot of, they have a lot of communications knowledge. Um, physics majors typically tend to do so as well. I know we'd love to have a bigger uh, showing of the fine arts because sometimes uh, we can struggle with communication disciplines, right, related disciplines, and especially when it comes to outreach or when presenting uh, proposals and having the right language, that's re really when we can value um, what what non-STEM majors can bring to the table. And I, I really want to emphasize that that's something we've learned at Aggies at Laboratory is that, you know, we're not just taking aero majors or just mechanical or even just people who, who like doing a lot of uh, uh, math related stuff for a living, it's it's really diverse and there's always a niche for you to fill if you've got the interest for it. Okay, Sean, you yeah. want to pick back on that? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely the diversity of majors is something that we try to emphasize. And recently this past week, actually, we had a design review with our professor and a few graduate students and a lead engineer in the industry. And one of the things that he noticed was, you know, our project manager is a mechanical engineer. You know, I'm an electrical engineer. We had astrophysicists. We had aerospace engineers, of course. We had math major. It was all over the place. And that's something that diversity of thought coming from these different backgrounds, even though they're in engineering and in the sciences and math, it's it really comes together to form like a very complete team that, you know, you don't get from just aerospace engineers, for example. So. Yeah, definitely one of the things that we try to promote is diversity of majors, which really helps grow the team. Definitely. William, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> at least with SEBS, um, we do have a lot of different engineering and, and STEM majors in general, um, which, is, which is definitely a good thing because uh, aerospace engineering isn't teaching you all of the parts of, of putting a rocket together. Um, we have a single electrical engineering course. Uh, if, if we were required to do all of the electronics ourselves, it would not go very well. Um, so yes, it, definitely don't think that in order to do aerospace and engineering, you have to major in it. You can major in physics and still contribute significantly to teams because um, I, I find that in general, a lot of what college STEM courses teach you to do is how to understand math and and how how to think like, well, in my case, an engineer, but physics and, and math courses can be adjacent to that. 
And with that mindset, you can learn all sorts of different skills that aren't even part of what you're learning in your courses. Um, <clears throat> I will say that I think an unfortunate failing of um, not necessarily just us, but the aerospace industry in general is that we are so STEM focused, um, which it makes some amount of sense because at the end of the day, it's an industry, it's there to make money and there isn't a lot of monetary demand yet for more of the humanities focused side of, of space. But I think as we're, we're looking to stay permanently on the moon and, and to colonize Mars, we need to think what we're actually sending there. We're, humanity is not just a person in a pressurized tin can. There is so much more to being a human and, and being a society than that. Um, and there's all sorts of untapped knowledge from all sorts of fields uh, that could significantly change the way that we grow to be an interplanetary species for the better. Definitely, definitely. What are some of those different use cases, if you would, of someone who isn't so STEM focused, but is, uh, you know, more in the arts or humanities, like, what are some of the things you've seen that really make sense at the end of the day, where you're like, wow, I didn't look at it like that. But no, I definitely see the need for someone like that. Yeah, um, I, I actually had an experience somewhat like this, I want to say two years ago, where I learned about this very, very new field called astrosociology. There's basically one guy who is driving this entire thing. His name is Jim Pass. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy. He's a professor. I, I can't remember what college. Um, but his main focus right now is like, what what does a society on Mars look like? How do you govern that? You know, like Mars is anywhere from five to, to 15 minutes away in terms of communication. A lot can happen in that time. And as you grow from a, a scientific team of eight people to a colony of 50 to a, a town of a thousand, you can't rely on having somebody on earth able to take care of things for you. Um, and at some point you need to be self-sustaining and, and what does a self-sustaining government on a hostile planet look like? And that's part of his whole thing is it's, it's, I'm not the most understanding of it. And I strongly encourage you to look it up, but that is just something that I hadn't really considered too deeply until like, I don't know, I think it popped up on LinkedIn or something. <laughs> And I, I read about it and it was really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm very happy in my engineering spot and I, I don't think I would switch to doing that, but it's still something that I, I really appreciate because those are the type of people that are looking beyond sending pressurized tin cans to Mars. <laughs> Definitely, that's unbelievable by the way. What else, what, have, what are some other things people have seen? So I would I would I would add real quick while we're on that topic. Um, I did have an interaction with another student here in the laboratory who is actually a philosophy major, and it never struck me that a big thing. Well, it it is obvious to us that there's a, a large degree of ethics involved with space engineering, especially when it concerns human space travel. But there's also a lot of um, I don't know the details, but there's a lot of legality behind the scenes when we develop these projects and also um, something that we're very, we're more familiar with being in Texas is uh, Boca Chica, if you guys are familiar with Starship, uh, SpaceX down in South Texas, uh, the development of that facility currently, uh, it, it, it has its toll on the environment, you know, and it, it's, it, it's next to a natural preserve. And it's really interesting to think that sometimes our advancements can have ethical consequences we don't think about immediately and that's something that that, that that's not in my coursework not it's not so present as, as it might be in others and that's something I appreciate a lot too so that's going along the lines of what William said right there yeah definitely yeah I can go next so uh, there are a few 
So as I mentioned, so on YouTube, uh, for United Thinkers, we have different interviews we do with different space champions. I think I've interviewed around 130 individuals, and they all have really unique backgrounds in the space industry. So I've had the opportunity to talk with space artists, space photographers, space policy analysts, government officials who work in the space industry, who advocate for budgeting for space, um, and literally any, every career, or most careers, I want to say, because I haven't probably touched every career, but most careers in space and from food scientists, literally everyone has such unique skill sets that they bring into space. And I love to think of space as its own little world. So every career you're going to need in the real world, whether it be a technician who actually helps bring that rocket from the lab to the ro launch site, you need everyone, you know, from from the beginning to the end, there are so many careers So literally combine any topic with space. And I'm positive that there is a career. And if there isn't, there will be a need for that career within the next 10 years, because space is just a rapidly growing industry. And I think there's like an estimate within the next next decade that it'll be a trillion dollar industry. So I think just looking at those numbers and seeing how um, that we're growing the industry, I think is just amazing. Um, something in specific is I think there's someone. Or I think someone's mic was on. Um, and one of the careers that intrigues me the most is space policy. Um, as we're looking, I think space has always and historically been a very political, uh, you know, way to show which country is better or more supreme. And it's been a bit, it was a very politicalized thing um, that was brought into the, that's how we grew the space industry, unfortunately, and a lot of space agency are government funded. So they are affiliated with the military. Um, NASA has a lot of, is very careful about who it partners with, who it collaborates with, just because it is government funded. And so as we're looking to go to Mars and to do all these really big things, international cooperation is really big. And as we go into colonizing different planets or even going back to the moon and having a base, trying to figure out what that looks like, what are the rules, what are the policies and regulations, we need space policy analysts who will, one, develop those rules, two, kind of facilitate the international cooperations we need, um, and three, like leading the government initiatives as well, kind of being a conduit between the space and STEM community and government officials, because that's there is a big gap. The government officials don't necessarily know the value of space, but if we can advocate it in terms that they understand, then they will continue creating like a budget for NASA, a budget for space that's necessary. So I think having that communication piece someone who can write well, someone who can speak well, someone who can take complicated information and make it simple to communicate it, not only with the government, but with the general public. Um, one of the ladies that I greatly look up to, her name is Emily Calendrilla, and she's known as the Space Gal on TikTok and Twitter. And she posts, she went, she did an aeronautical engineering degree at MIT, and now she's a space communicator. She has her own Netflix show. And so I think just being able to also take her passion for communication and turning it into something that's important and valuable in space it's incredible um, another aspect of space is like space medicine something that i'm particularly passionate about um as we're looking to go to Mars, and William mentioned a really great point we won't be able to receive communication from someone who's traveling to Mars or in Mars for like 20 ish minutes and that's just one way so by the time we get their response is 20 minutes and by the time they get our response like another 20 minutes so that's like almost an hour so I think it's just thinking about that large gap we need tools we need diagnostic tools um we need AI to be able to aid humans in space when we cannot help them from earth um whether that be a physician on board or an AI a robot that can diagnose you know, a medical condition or some sort of if you're if you feel like you're exposed to radiation, what do you do? You may not be clinically trained, but we need some sort of tool to be able to give to them. And all of the things that we develop will then come back down to Earth to make healthcare more accessible, to bring out all that technology we're creating for space to come back to our turn. So literally, I can go all day talking about the interdisciplinary careers of space and why it's important. But I think um, space policy and space medicine are some of the two biggest rapidly growing um, careers that I see. Definitely. That's great. Keshav, do you have anything to Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, definitely like the communication link between, you know, Earth and you know, other places in the solar system is, is something to take into consideration in the sense that, you know, they need to be self-containing, but also the kind of much further down the line, the regulatory aspects of that communication. For example, on Earth, we have the FCC that like regulates the communication uh, bandwidth and you know frequencies that we that we talk to things in space in. Uh, but as we go, you know, 
further self-contained communication networks within the solar system, for example, on the moon, if we decide to do that, or on Mars eventually. You know, there are regulatory bodies that need to take that into account. And that's definitely something that's interdisciplinary, you know, and something that is necessary that we don't necessarily think about today. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely a, a, an interesting problem that we eventually need to solve. But on a more personal note, in terms of inter interdisciplinary, you know, majors that I see in, in that stuff in our club, before kind of this year, I was only involved in the engineering aspect of our club. So I didn't really get to see like all the behind the scenes. But this year, I'm also on the admin board as internal vice president. And I get to see, you know, if we try to make an event happen uh, and if we try to, you know, if we need to build these CubeSats in our high altitude balloon, we need money for that. And something that you don't really see as an engineer is, okay, I order the part from DG Key and I'm just waiting for the part to come. You don't see like, okay, our finance officer has to go through, order the part, you know, communicate with the sender, communicate with the school to see where we receive the part. And it's not something that you really see as you're, you know, building a system how much that goes into actually procuring the parts and, you know, purchasing and all that behind the scenes stuff. So that's definitely something that I've noticed and something that I took for granted before this year and definitely realized that we need that kind of interdisciplinary, you know, finance business aspect of it in space. Definitely. 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 Um, before we get into the next topic, I feel that if anyone has any questions in the audience, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I think it'd be cool if, if anyone wants to ask anything, we have time at the end to get to some questions. So putting that out there. But um, next sort of question I wanted to touch on was about people that you see in this space, like that are super, it, it's very enthusiastic. That's one thing that caught me initially, just by speaking with all of you. I was like, wow, like I've not been in space ever, but I, I mean, I want to learn more about it. I want to hang out with these people. Basically, it's like, that's, you know, it's a great group of people. And it is early on still, there's a lot of room to grow, but it's building momentum each day. Um, and I'm curious, what do you see with the people that are really, you know, standout people that have applied themselves? What are sort of their characteristics, their tendencies, things that help them make impacts in this space when it's really in its earlier stages? Um, you know, what are some of those people and, and what do they do to make themselves stand out? So something that I've seen that's, that's consistent across every single person that I've met who is is enthusiastic in, sp in, in space and does a fantastic job as an aerospace engineer, um, it, it has nothing to do with their background. It has nothing to do with what they look like or, or anything like that. The, the key thing is a willingness to learn. A lot of them started all all over the place. Most of them were, you know, same age as me going into college. Pretty similar path. But I, I know a couple people who are in their 30s and they were doing something else through the start of their lives. And then despite, you know, being at a, a later stage in their life with more things tying them down, they still just wanted to to learn so much and wanted to contribute so badly that even though they started at a probably difficult time to start they they pulled through so i think really the the key thing is if you want to learn then regardless of where you are as long as you take that willingness and do something with it you can learn just about anything. That, that's not even true of the space industry. I would say that's a, a general truth in life. Yeah, to add on to that, definitely. I feel like I've seen a lot of people in the space industry who, you know, may not necessarily have a background um, in engineering or like who are interested in space. They don't necessarily have a background in engineering. But if they do, they also have you know, other aspects to them. They're not just interested, you know, purely in aerospace engineering. They don't really have a narrow focus because I think to be truly passionate about space, you need to have like a far reaching, you know, mindset and something, you know, profound uh, that you view space as. So just to give an example, like my professor and my mentor for the Brune spacecraft at UCLA, he 
graduated from his undergraduate, you know, and then uh, as an engineer. And then for 10 years, he pursued music as a professional career. So when I first heard that, I was like, wait, this guy's my professor. And he did music for 10 years. And then he got his PhD at Caltech in aerospace engineering. Wow. So that's something that definitely, I think, stands out about a lot of people in general, maybe not to that extreme, who are interested in space, but you know, they have definitely other aspects about them on the more, you know, humanities and art side in terms of that way of thinking that I think sets them apart in terms of true passion for space. Yeah, I can also add um, briefly my take on this question. Uh, so first I wanna preface that in case some people might not see it this way, but I believe that space is not a one person game. Uh, you know, when you go into the space industry, you realize you're turning one one gear, man, and that's coming a big part of a big machine, and it's all different people. So you ultimately you choose a discipline and how you're gonna push everything, right? And so that being said, the people that always help the most um, and contribute the most to our projects through their own areas is are the people that are willing to get good and do the hard work. Um, it's it's just it's it's uh it's difficult to really get good at what you do especially when it comes down to a stem discipline right especially when it comes down to programming um it, it's just hard to put in the hours sometimes especially when you know this work involves critical thinking a lot of memorization a lot of practice uh the people who outstand the most and our teams are those who are willing to just put in the time to get good at their own craft because it, it's it's kind of a, a a weird answer to hear but it is not the people who know the most people or the people who dream about rockets every night or whatever that make the biggest difference. It's the people who during the work day, they really work to get their job right. And when they do it well, those are the people that push the project leaps and bounds ahead. So I think diligence goes a really long way and, and probably in anything, to be honest. Yeah, I will echo what everybody else said. I think I definitely agree the importance of passion and having something else that they're particularly interested in space. Another way I kind of want to answer this question, just to add on to this conversation, is most of the mentors who I've met, like I mentioned in the beginning, not, I didn't know anybody in the space industry growing up. So for me, I didn't know I could really be a part of space. But what really enabled me to get my foot in the industry, to be able to network with different professionals was reaching out on LinkedIn and seeing these professionals who are so open and ready to help and pay it forward. I was shocked. Honestly, I created a LinkedIn account, I think in 10th grade, beginning of 10th grade. And I just started, I wrote about myself and I just started reaching out. I think I reached out to over a hundred individuals from different backgrounds, um, things that I was particularly interested in, um, things I was intrigued by in their stories, people who probably would never respond to me or someone who I would never, ever meet in my real life. But I had the opportunity to send them a message for free. So I used to do that all the time. And I met some of my greatest mentors through that platform. And I think it just shows that because space is in its beginning stages, everyone who's already in the industry is ready to pay it forward. They're ready to inspire the next generation. They're ready to create that next workforce who is going to expand the mission that we already have. And everyone in space is basically living their childhood dream. Um, I read this statistic somewhere that I think around 90% of young children are excited about space. Um, of course, not 90% of humans are in the space industry, but why not? You know, I think we need to have more people in the space industry. And I think that passion just kind of becomes unrealistic as you grow older. Like if you were to tell someone, I want to become an astronaut in, when you're little, they'll be like, wow, it's amazing. That's amazing. You should do it. And then if you say, I want to become an astronaut in high school, people might be like, I don't know if that's a real career, or if you could actually become an astronaut. That seems kind of like a child's dream. And people just kind of give up on their dream and they think that that's not a viable option. Um, but I think people who are already in the space industry know that it is possible to be a part of space. It is possible to become an astronaut. They're living their childhood dream. And that's why they're so passionate. I have never met, so far at least, a person who hates their job and they're in the space industry. Everyone is excited to talk about what they do. Everybody's excited for the future. Of course, there are hesitate. there's different hesitations, whether it be about commercialization or the approach to certain situations, but everyone's passionate about space exploration. 
passion. And so a defining characteristic, I think, is passion and also perseverance. None of the people who have been so successful from NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver, I was speaking with, with her, I interviewed her, and she was saying that she started off as a secretary at National Space Society and worked her way up all the way to becoming a deputy administrator of NASA. You know, I, I met a person who has their own show at NASA called Ask an Astrobiologist, who was actually addicted to drugs at his earlier stages. Um, and he came out of that like an opioid drug addiction, and he became a host of a NASA show. Um, I've met individuals who grew up with parents in prison. There have been some difficult stories, but they are so successful because they're passionate, they're determinate, and I think they're just ready to pay it forward. So I think those are some key characteristics that makes everyone who's involved in space so passionate about what they do and stick with what they're doing. I love that. Great answers from everybody. I think you all kind of ring similar truths with everything you've said. Um, very, very cool. And we did, we did get a question from the audience here from Derek Rodriguez. He wants to know what's one goal everyone wants to accomplish within the next one to two years within your organizations? Who wants to kick that off? Well, uh, for SEDS, um, my big goal for the club, well, we have two. <laughs> uh, the first one is to launch our first team built rocket. We're a very new club. Uh, and, and we've been struggling to get members. And I feel like if we complete a project and, and have the video of launching it, that will help grow our club a lot because people will see that we've actually accomplished something. Um, in a similar vein, we have a smaller project, which is a, a gaseous um, <clears throat> bipropellant rocket engine. Um, and I'm hoping we can do a hot fire for that this year because that would would also serve a similar purpose. And even aside from that, both of those things would just be very fun to witness. Yeah, I guess similarly for us, we have, we're also kind of struggling to get a lot of new members uh, because we haven't had much proved experience in the past in terms of, you know, successful launches that current members can see. So one of the things that we're trying to do with our CubeSat, at least, is, uh, well, just to give a little bit of background, our, we have a 3U CubeSat project that the primary payload is a miniature ion thruster. So our goal is to integrate the ion thruster and provide all the you know, electrical and closed system infrastructure for that, as well as a, two, as well as a, a satellite bus. So by the end of the year, it's really aggressive, but by the end of the year, we're trying to have a flat set, which is basically all the subsystems laid out, you know, hopefully in a vacuum chamber and have, you know, a static fire uh, of the thruster in the vacuum chamber. And I feel like that would be extremely motivating for all of us because that's the first time that we're seeing, you know, our work actually come to fruition and be like, okay, this is something that we can do and something that we can actually realistically launch into space. And hopefully within the two year, two to three year time frame, we can miniaturize that in a CubeSat form factor and get a launch, which I think will be, you know, at least personally, extremely motivating for me to continue working in the space industry, seeing something I work on come to fruition. Yeah, um, uh, that that that's awesome. Speaking from a from a CubeSat laboratory here, that that sounds amazing, Keisha. That's 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 exciting. <laughs> but um, so from our end, some one of our some of our goals here. So our organization is pretty diverse in the sense that our projects scale from um, Air Force funded projects to smaller few thousand dollar projects that, you know, we request funding for. And one of my goals is uh, so to set up a structure within the organization where we have a continuous feed from sponsors and other and, and donations and such and encourage people to just have this cycle of gaining money because one of the one of the things you find in space is that it's not cheap and it's hard to get money for uh <laughs> unlike a lot of things like the civil industry for example prime example you know you need that a lot of people it, it's not on their priority list to get stuff in space right so one of the things you learn in space the funding is hard and we've been blessed to have quite a few of our projects already good to go and people are having a great time working on it but setting up this organization infrastructure or we can continuously get sponsorships and donations and then turn them and get manage them prop those funds properly into projects that will 
um, impact as many people as possible is something that's really important to me right now. And, and it's, a, it's an infrastructure we're working on here. So it ties into that earlier discussion about why we need more than just STEM majors, because, uh, uh, you know, Keisha, you mentioned how we never see what happens in the finance side of things. But I can tell you, I'm an aerospace major. I landed this program manager job and I see all the background <laughs> and I definitely see how finance and management backgrounds really help the industry move forward. And that's something I'm trying to get set up here too. <laughs> yeah, now that we're on the conversation of finance, I feel like I have to mention when I was at the finance conference, everybody was like an economist and they didn't really understand space. But one thing, like New York is like a hub for finance and investments, but a lot of that money goes out of New York to other states. And so this whole conference was about trying to bring that money and like let it stay in New York to build the space industry. Of course, New York is a there. You can't really have a whole rocket launch site. I feel like it's very difficult in New York, but I think trying to keep investments in New York for that. And the conversation around it was so interesting that I'm actually mining in econ, which I feel like is important. Having a STEM background is important, but having a non-STEM degree is just as valuable. So I agree. Um, and in terms of Columbia Space Initiative, I'm a freshman, as I mentioned. So I'm just getting my feet dipped into the different activities and events that they're doing. So I wish our president could have been here to really talk about the goals that they have for the future. But from what I've been able to kind of understand with my first two, three months in the club is that we are recently starting to build a new rocket from scratch. Last year, we attempted to launch a rocket that we built at the Newport competition. And I, I don't believe it launched because of a technical issue didn't get past safety, the safety checks. So we hope to, we're restarting completely this year with a completely new rocket and new propulsion system. So hopefully um, we continue to work on that and improve it. Um, I'm particularly, I'm on the space microbiology team and we recently got a grant from uh, New York Space Consortium to build a payload that could be sent on the ISS. And so we're working on conducting some experiments and potentially developing some sort of experiment where we could conduct data analysis on once it flies um, in space compared to ground control. So we're kind of figuring out an experiment we could potentially send to, on the ISS. And um, we also have a few, like we're trying to, again, look for funding, get grants to be able to outreach to more students. Um, I, we have a CubeSat team and robotics team uh, and like a lot of competitions that we're taking part in every year. I, I'm not involved in those teams. So I don't necessarily know what's happening, but I know our goal is to continue um, increasing our membership, continue doing what we're doing at a larger scale um, and more consistently. In terms of Ignited Thinkers, uh, we want to continue expanding our outreach more internationally and reaching out uh, to a lot of younger students in schools. We recently helped a young girl uh, in high school, she's a ninth grader in New York, Scarlett Hartsman start her first rocketry club and they never her school never had a rocketry club before so we kind of helped sponsor her to be able to start her own rocketry club which is really exciting because she has I think around 50 members which is incredible um, and she's been leading this and so we hope to be able to take this model of how we helped her start her rocketry club and be able to implement this in multiple schools across New York as well as hopefully across the states and raise money for that and to be able to um, we're also creating a proof of concept with a space contest in Zimbabwe for next summer. So we hope that's a success and we get to be able to do these types of contests in other areas where space is just emerging. Um, Zimbabwe has a space agency that they recently formed um, about, I think, I want to say a decade ago, uh, less than a decade ago. And they want to get, they want to pipeline a lot of these students in Zimbabwe into their agency right after college. And so we want to be able to support organizations like that to be able to inspire students and professionals to think of space as a real career and continue increasing our outreach through different um, facets and through different outreach methods. Yeah, those are kind of our goals. Love it, I love it. And I know Keisha, I've actually had a question uh, to ask everybody. Yeah. So. I feel like a lot of this discussion, a little bit tying into our previous discussion on, uh, you know, passion in space. A lot of it we've discussed has been space exploration, you know, looking outwards. But personally, I've been involved on the defense side as well. I worked at Northrop Grumman for two years in the classified defense side. So it's a, definitely a completely different world. And I feel like there's not a lot of motivation for that in terms of people who are interested in space are typically interested in space exploration. I feel like that's definitely much more easy to get interested in, in terms of uh, conceptually, because 
you kind of know what's out there. You know what we could do to get out there. But in terms of defense, it's not really well known um, how to get how to get involved and what that really looks like. So I'm kind of curious to see what you guys think, how we can increase passion for defense as well, because national security is definitely a problem in this day and age. Yeah, that's a really good question. I honestly, I agree that everyone that I've met in space, we've always talked about space exploration and the idea of defense. I feel like I've only talked with one individual, which is crazy to think about. She works in the drones industry and she does a lot related to security and drones um, in order to inspire. So when we talk, at least when I'm talking with younger students, I feel like they don't understand the import. I mean, they don't know, like they don't, they don't really care about defense as much because they don't understand. It is not, it's not exciting. But when they think of aliens, that's something more tangible. Like, oh, we can go out and try to see if life exists outside of our planet. So space exploration just seems more exciting. And a lot of the technology that we develop from space exploration is used in defense. But particularly in the defense realm, that's a tough question. But I think something that I would, I've talked with a few individuals in the Air Force um, or like the military, and they have a lot of passion for defense. Something that we could do to encourage students is maybe have more internship opportunities and outreach from like the Air Force. I know the Air Force has like a STEM outreach department. So maybe trying to have them kind of come and speak with students, talk about these defense opportunities. Um, I, I, that's a really tough, that's a really good question. We need to, I think it's hard to excite students about defense. But I think also trying to get more computer science majors interested in the defense where and going into space and defense would be interesting. I think more outreach is just necessary and maybe organizations who are dedicated towards this effort of defense and having them like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin do more outreach efforts related to defense and in, in, like encouraging high school students to get involved. Um, I think that's how you got passionate about defense. So maybe just trying to expand those outreach efforts could be a good way to approach so yeah, yeah, I, outreach is a big one there. Um, definitely a, an interesting question, a conversation that's had a lot down here. Uh, I think the biggest problem with defense is that a lot of people find sometimes ethical conflicts working for them, whether you agree with that or not, you know, separate discussion. Um, but what I think we could do more for is uh, demonstrating how the defense industry seeks advancements and that inevitably leaks into the space exploration. Uh, this would be true with, you know, prime example, and the, the one on top of my head is hypersonics, right? Missiles, all of that, you know, it this all of this uh, high high heat, super viscous flow scenario stuff is super applicable to space. But you know that a lot of that research currently gets funded more and really. Um, it's a bit more tangible, more frequent in the defense sector. And so it's sometimes important to recognize that. That also comes down to, you know, maybe surveillance, right? If you're interested in in, in satellite imagery, you can think about how that lines up with uh, government um, contractors, right? So I think outreach is a big one, and it definitely is also relating it with space exploration because one of my favorite... Um, one of my favorite examples right now, I'm currently quite a fan of uh, Sierra Space. If you guys are familiar with Sierra Space and Dream Chaser, which is uh, a space plane hoping to, you know, do its operations in 2023. And I know that there's currently, uh, that's getting funded by, you know, probably the Air Force, maybe the Space Force, I'm not 100% sure. And that is because uh, from a logistical standpoint, it is very beneficial for them to have a quick way to get, um, get, supplies to the ISS and from the ISS to any port in the world and ultimately what we see as you know the uh, a current flagship in space travel is also very beneficial to the space and this uh to the military industry in terms of logistics and just making things easier more efficient so I think maybe making those links sometimes is very helpful and people don't normally think about them Yeah. Um, again, being in an aerospace city, there are a lot of people who are already interested <laughs> in uh, the defense side. Um, for me personally, it's not really something I care to do, uh, but 
I, I think it it is something that is important because I think regardless of your opinion on the United States military, an unfortunate truth in today's world is that if we were to abandon research and development and production in the defense industry entirely, within 10 years, there would be some other global superpower that would start strong arming us into doing uh, things that we would probably not want to do. So I, I think it's something important for everybody to consider um, that it is an unfortunate necessity of how the world works. Yeah, great answers all the way around. I mean, I, I personally can't speak to that specifically because I'm not involved in space, you know, industry or, you know, defense in particular, but just with anything that you ever do, I mean, you put a lot of effort into it um, and understanding the effort that goes into something and understanding the need to protect it, whether that's actually how you're building your rocket or your entire infrastructure and logistics. Um, I can see, you know, Gitika, why you're saying the it's harder for the younger kids to get their head around it because they haven't put all, you know, to say you're six years old, you haven't put years of effort into building a particular system. Um, and so it comes with experience and it comes with failure. Um, it comes with bumping into those walls. And, uh, you know, the, the more time goes on, the more we will and the more it will become pressing. And it's like, you know, it's like why we all understand why you need to keep your social security secret or your credit card information to yourself. You know, it's, it, it, the more we run into problems, the more we'll understand the need for it. And I think that will naturally develop over time for sure. Um, especially with what we were saying earlier with the fact that it was, you know, a very politically fueled industry to begin with. Hey, let's get to the moon. Let's show that we're able to do this. Um, and ultimately, you know, it kind of goes against the theme that I've noticed in the space industry, which is, hey, let's work together to achieve something more. Um, but again, there are those fundamental building blocks of the industry, whether that's company to company, country to country, or department to department. Um, so I think the more friction we run into, which is inevitable, the, the more it will make sense that defense is something that's really pressing and needed. So I think it's a sweet question. Any other questions that any of the panelists want to ask each other or anything from the audience that anyone wants to ask? There are no questions from the audience. I did have like a wrapping question I wanted to ask everyone, um, which is what does space mean to you? I think it would be interesting to just hear from everyone what, I know we talked about what inspired us in space, but just kind of out looking into the future, what does space mean to you? Like what, maybe you can answer of like what inspires you about space or what do you look forward to, but what does space mean to you? Oh, I do see a question in the chat. So do we want to answer that before we answer mine? Yeah, let's okay. do let's do one in the chat and then we'll close it out with yours. I like that. Yeah. Um I am not sure about training programs broadly, but I will say that a, a very um traditional path, especially for research, is college. Uh you typically you get your undergrad and then some people either go and work for industry for a little while or they go straight into grad school. But if you want to go the research route, you're probably going to need at least a master's um, to be more involved in the, the decision making side of research. You can definitely work in research with an undergrad, um, but you will probably not be on like the, the planning um side of, of things you'll probably be more working with um day-to-day -day research tasks <clears throat> yeah to add on to that i think a lot of people who contribute to research typically have masters or phds in the field and sometimes it's not necessarily directly correlated to the space industry some examples of this are like communication um, satellite communication with the earth that's a traditionally an ee field and it's related to space and a lot of advancements for communication are made in that electrical engineering field but that you know forward driving research directly contributes to you know the communication systems that we see in satellites today and there's also in the space industry uh, industry and 
aerospace engineering, you have things like spacecraft propulsion systems, which, you know, a heavily, uh, heavy amount of research is going into that. And that's something that I'm particularly interested in as well, is, you know, future spacecraft propulsion systems. What does that look like? How do we get into deep space better? And so typically for that, there's a lot of research that's done at universities and at some companies actually as well. Um, so that, yeah, doing research in those companies or getting an advanced degree like William mentioned are definitely ways to get involved in the research aspect of it. Yeah, so I I'm a I definitely agree with what the other two panelists were mentioning about like the educational piece, but also I'm a huge proponent on starting young in the industry and realizing that age is not a boundary to getting involved in research. Um, growing up, especially in high school, I used to be like, oh, I need to have an undergraduate degree or a bachelor's you know degree, a master's degree, a PhD to get involved in research, but that's not true because I was able to get involved in research in high school and even publish a paper in high school with a few scientists. And that was because of, even if I had no educational background or experience, even 1% to their ability or those scientists' ability, I put myself in an uncomfortable situation to be able to learn and grow. So the best way that I did that was through um, cold emailing. It's I think it's it's kind of underlooked sometimes, but I a lot of opportunities are not open to high school students um, or even some undergraduates, especially in your first and second year. But if you see a researcher, you see a lab, you see some sort of work that's intriguing and interesting, don't be afraid to email that lab. Don't be afraid afraid to email um, a principal investigator in that lab and be like, hey, I'm really interested in your research. Is there a way I can learn more or potentially be involved in some capacity? Because more than likely, they're looking for someone who's energetic and passionate to help with some portion of their project. Um, I remember I was really intrigued with the work that Baylor College of Medicine Space Medicine Center was doing in radiation countermeasures. And so I just reached out to them and I reached out to multiple actually, but I only received one response and I'm gonna be talking about the successful response. Even though there were hundreds of emails I did not get a response to. And this um, individual did get back to me and he was like, I love your passion, let's talk about this. And I ended up spending like an hour call with him and I joined his team to write a manuscript. And so that's how I got my first like publication experience, just cold emailing and be like, hey, can I, can I work with you? And so, if you see something that's interesting to you and you're really passionate about it, don't let age or like a certain requirement stop you from it. There's also a lot of opportunities for high school and college students, especially undergraduates, whether that be like the Brooke Owens Fellowship, the Said Factor Fellowship. There's also the Matthew Fellowship or some sort of, um, there's a lot of undergraduate programs, research fellowships, MIT has a lot, Caltech has a lot. A lot of schools have fellowships that you can apply to even if you don't attend their school, whether that be a summer internship, a fall or spring internship. There's also NASA internships, Blue Origin, SpaceX. There are a lot of opportunities. It's just a matter of putting yourself out there, putting that application in, and just reaching out. I think this can go along. I think all I can do is just echo what everyone said. You hit all the points. Um, you know, getting involved. Um, just depending on the kind of audience you are uh, watching here, whether you're a high school student, that, that definitely... Um, I, I believe it's a good idea to reach out while you're a senior. You're already looking at these things. You have a you have a college in mind. Feel free to email if you can find the contact for the laboratory because I know a lot of professors they see that and they're like, all right, as soon as you come in, you you have that interest in high school, you you become a freshman, and even though you're a freshman in undergrad, you know uh, they still are like, all right, yeah, come on, come on by the lab, we'll talk and see what's up. So don't don't be discouraged, right? Like you said, by age, but also if you're in college. Um, I can't speak for other schools, but, you know, there's usually good organizations or laboratories where you can definitely get hands on and start working with a professor. So, yeah, uh, education, that's that's the best venue. <laughs> I, I will add a little, which is um, in my experience and, and in the experience of most other undergrads I've talked with who have done research, um, a lot of the time, especially in freshman and sophomore year, you're not going to contribute much to the uh, math side of things. You are basically going to be a lab technician, which might not be the most glamorous thing in the world, but you also gain access to, to so many connections and so many resources and so many people who can teach you those things so you can then go on to do what you might consider the more exciting side of research, which is the actual here's the mathematical like 
model I think describes this. This is what I want to investigate side of things. Um, and even in like senior year, um, our college UW and, and a lot of other engineering colleges require you to do a capstone, which is like a, a several months uh, student project. And a lot of those times, those projects end up being research projects that some senior who has worked with the professor for a year or two has an idea and they go to their professor and they're like, hey, I want to do this thing for my capstone. Is there capacity for it in your lab? And they're like, sure. So <laughs> you might have to start small, but you can definitely build bigger from that. Yeah, I guess to add on to that a little bit, uh... Not to keep this going too long, but something that is kind of overlooked is you don't necessarily need to have a particular skill set to work in that industry's lab, for example. So this past year, I was working in the plasma and space proportion lab at UCLA. And, you know, I didn't, as an electrical engineer, I didn't really know what was going on much on the, you know, fluids and plasma side of it, but I was able to help out doing data analysis on spectral images that we got. Um, and that really helped kind of drive, you know, what the spectral missions looked like. I was able to use my data science knowledge to contribute to that. So it's not necessarily like a one-to-one -one mapping. Like I need to know how this particular technology works exactly to contribute to that kind of research. There's definitely other ways that you can contribute. Definitely, definitely. Great answers from everybody. I hope that helped Olga. And uh, Gitika, you had your question that you wanted to wrap this up with. So go ahead and ask it again. Yeah, so my question to kind of, I felt like it's a good question because we're all really passionate about space, is what does space mean to you? And it could be taken in so many different directions, whether it be like what inspires you, what are you looking forward to, what is embodied for you? Just like what does space mean to you? I think Oliver accidentally kicked himself out, but does anybody want to start? And if not, I could go ahead. I don't mind starting on this one. That's all good with everyone. Um, I think I think Oliver is still here with us, hopefully. So I I actually have kind of an idealistic take on this answer. So in 1492, when Columbus sold the ocean blue, I don't think anyone really knew what would happen. You know, I, I, like... I, I don't think anyone understood the effects that finding this whole new continent would have, right? And, you know, uh, just that's a little oversimplified. But my point being there is that we don't know what might happen out of space industry. Because currently right now, uh, a lot of people think, well, okay, so what if we go to Mars? Even though that's freaking cool, a lot of people don't see the tangible benefits to that. And the reality is that we don't really know. I mean, a lot of in, in the science sector, they, they have a better idea of how like that those discoveries can affect us and, and on Earth. But I don't think things back then were seen as well. They probably saw, well, we just found a lot more gold, we, a lot more spices. You know, th this is a money making thing right here. It could be very similar right now. And that's what I think space is. And I think we are way too still way too early in the in the in the process to see what it's going to be um that's my take on that i i just love space exploration i uh, like i said i just grew up huge on sci-fi so i mean I'm, I'm all for it but i i my take on it is definitely that it's just all the unknowns and the fact that we don't know what's there is even more exciting it's just there, there's a huge potential here and people you know right now we're seeing all the constraints all the limitations with space travel and fuel energy is our biggest enemy right here but we will we will figure it out like, like people always have it'll get figured out and when it does it's gonna be crazy that's my take on that yeah building on that i think personally at least i believe that you know as humans we're built to explore and kind of go into unknown places like Marco mentioned when we started discovering the Americas it was like wow this new sense of what's out there we were kind of exploring that and that that's an innate sense that we have as humans I believe and so you know expanding into the solar system and into the galaxy and universe at large I think that's something that as humans we are meant to do and that's something that we have deep inside us is driving us 
to you know do all these technological advancements because I believe to propagate humanity into you know the rest of the universe. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't really have much to add. Uh, when I think of space, I just think of the, the Star Trek space, the final frontier, because that's that's what it is to me. It's it's the future. It's the unknown. It's the, the what's left to explore and learn from and benefit from. And yeah, like Marco said, I, I don't think there's any solid way to predict that but I, I do see it as a necessity for the survival of humanity in the long term because um <laughs> eventually something will go wrong with the earth or something will go wrong with the sun or a nearby star will have a bad day and explode and dose us with horrible horrible amounts of gamma radiation <laughs> so if we want our species to survive, we eventually need to expand beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. Yeah, those are all really great. I think just embody what space is all about. And for me, very similar, I think, to what all of you three said was, I think space is a catalyst for innovation. Um, you know, I always ask questions like from the silliest ones when I was little to like, you know, why does everything that I drop go down? Like, what what is gravity? I can't see it. Like, what is it? What does it mean? You know, why does the moon change shapes or change shapes? So like from questions like that to be able, able to ask more difficult questions, like what happens to humans in space? What is, you know, what happens to bone density loss in space? What does that mean for humans? Um, I think going from those silly to tough questions, I think embodies the spirit of space. Um, space enables us to both pose and answer difficult questions that enable us to really create the technology we have today, from like the GPS to solar panels to, um, you know, scratch resistant lenses to radiation protection gear, literally every, a lot of the most incredible innovations we have stemmed from space and space truly is for earth. So I think that's the beauty of space that I like is that it, it enables us to ask difficult questions, but also solve them and enable humans to really propel forward. So yeah, I definitely agree with that. I love that. I love that. And, you know, just listening to everybody speak and all the things that they've been able to do, it it is cool that you can put a problem that you'd normally see in, say, an Earth environment or that normal environment and bring it somewhere else. And you can look and say, wow, there's more to this problem even in our own initial environment. And um, that's what gets me excited talking to every one of you. It's, it's, you know, looking for ways to become more energy efficient, you know, and save efforts. And ultimately, like you said, develop our species into a more productive one um, that can sustain ourselves in different environments. And, you know, ultimately that's, that's what you're, you're hoping to do at the end of the day. So it's always an inspiration speaking to everybody. This has been awesome. I know we're running over time now, but um, I do want to thank everybody again for coming on and get a Thank you so much for helping orchestrate so much of this. Um, and to the audience, thank you for tuning in and asking questions. It's been uh, it's been a heck of an experience. And, you know, I know we hope to do more of these and incorporate some industry leaders as well. And uh, so stay tuned. And uh, again, go get out there, go learn about space, dig in. And uh, you know who to ask if you've got any questions. Thank you.